The scripture this morning is taken from two different books of the Bible. First one is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, 11 through 12, and verse 15 from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. The second is from the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, from the English Standard Version. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here ends the reading of his word. Oh, 
Our kids had a great time this week, learned a lot, had fun, learned some fun music, and that was one example, joined by a special guest uh, performer this morning um, who uh, really livened things up. So my great thanks to our music staff, Carol and Kim, and, and our Family Ministries Coordinator, Laura, uh, for all their work this week. And Jen Candid was an uh, assistant and every day volunteering. And then many other parents also brought snacks and other things. And I don't want to name because I know I'll leave out, but thanks to you who did that. Uh, it was a fine, fine week. This week, an interesting picture came across my Facebook feed. It was a picture of an Eskimo captioned with the following dialogue. Eskimo, if I did not know about God and sin, would I go to hell? Priest, no, if you did not know. Eskimo, then why did you tell me? There's actually a whole lot of Christian history and difference in perspectives embodied in that exchange. In fact, from the earliest days of the church, there was a difference in opinion about the ultimate fate of those who didn't know the gospel or those who had never had the opportunity to hear it or those who did but then did not, in fact, choose to believe. The Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory is not simply this odd netherworldish place created to worry people, but in its intent was meant to offer people every possible chance, even after death, to believe in Christ and be saved. Of course, notice something that way of formulating it assumes that those who don't explicitly choose to believe in Christ will in fact be damned and eventually sent to eternal hell by God. That point of view in fact was the basis for one of the most disturbing funeral sermons I have ever heard. The minister recounted a conversation that he had had with the grieving widow. He said that she had asked him, will I see him again in heaven? And then he told everyone there in the packed church his answer, probably not, because he was not a Christian. And as much as I know that you will miss him, he is likely now in hell for refusing to believe in Jesus. It was one of the most cruel moments I think I have ever experienced. Our gospel scripture for this morning is one of the most beloved texts in the New Testament. It is regularly read, and rightly so, at funerals. Many people can quote it, and take comfort in its language, and some raised with the King James Version hold near to their hearts that line, in my Father's house are many mansions. But it can also be a troubling scripture. And that funeral sermon from that minister, however cruel it was indeed, did zero in on the most troubling aspect of these verses. No one comes to the Father, but by me. Last week I quoted the great disciples, teacher, and preacher Fred Craddock. Let me do so again today. Craddock, in his down-home southern way, once said that both the Bible and the history of the church could be seen as the story of the tension between two overall principles, y'all come on the one hand and quality control on the other. <laughs> that is to say, is God's love particular or is it universal? Will only some be saved or will all finally be saved? 
John's depiction of Jesus here in our scripture for the morning is full of this tension. We can see it in just these few verses. For on the one hand, Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, implying it could be argued that there may in fact be other ways to salvation. After all, Jesus says elsewhere in John, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. But on the other hand, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. On the face of it, that seems rather restrictive. Particular or universal, restrictive or non-restrictive. Indeed, quality control versus y'all come. How do we understand all of this? Well, there are generally two kinds of responses that folks have made to this tension. One sociologist says this, there is on the one hand, quote, the pluralist position that there is salvation in other names beside Jesus, besides Jesus's, and Christians should simply drop this language. And there is on the other hand, the exclusivist position that the words must be taken straightforwardly and that there is no salvation in any other name. Let's look more closely for a moment at the first response, the inclusive, inclusive list, pluralist one. Those who would say that there are a variety of paths to salvation and that the many rooms language includes anyone with a sincere belief. These are the folks who often say, well, aren't all religions heading toward the same place? Aren't they all equally valid? It's the attitude expressed in that famous Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown says, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. The problem with this approach is simply this. It does matter. It does matter a great deal what you believe. A preacher by the name of Dan Clendenin forcefully explains why it matters. Listen to his words carefully. The problem, he says, with complete and utter inclusivity is, quote, that some religious views and practices are clearly false and harmful and even despicable. I don't think, he says, that Aztec human sacrifice and Buddhist almsgiving should expect equal allegiance. Hindu widow burning, female infanticide, and the mass suicide of those at Jim Jones's People's Temple all strike me, he says, as horribly wrong. Or take another example, when Warren Jeffs the leader of the fundamentalist Mormon sect based in Colorado City, Utah, directs that girls of 11, 12, and 13 years of age be turned over to 50 and 60 and 70 year old men to use and abuse and impregnate and tells those girls that if they resist these, quote, marriages, unquote, they're going to hell, is this? just one more religious lifestyle, one that is equally valid with others? I don't think so, and neither, I suspect, do you. So Reverend Clendenin nails it, I think, when he says this, quote, so saying that all religions are equally valid comes at the unacceptably high price of endorsing both the diabolical as well as the divine, both the diabolical as well as the divine, not what any of us wants. Well, if easy inclusivity, if y'all come run rampant, if thinking that the Father's house has so many rooms that 
Anyone who believes anything can find lodging there so long as they are sincere if these are not what we want to affirm in the face of such despicable practices. What about the opposite view? What about the view that says that indeed that there, are, there is no other way to salvation than through the correct sort of belief in Jesus and that those who don't have that belief, those beliefs, are damned and will spend eternity in hell. Is that where we want to go instead? That point of view leads to the kind of funeral sermon that I experienced. It logically leads to the conclusion that your Muslim friend, your Buddhist family member, your Jewish doctor, your nephew who is an atheist, and on and on and on will be punished forever for not having the right beliefs. I can't quite go there either. And again, I suspect that you can't either. Such a view seems so utterly at odds with a God who, even though he rightly gets furious at the folly and sin of human beings sometimes, still does not want any of them lost forever. Such a view seems so at odds with the God who, as it says in our other scripture for the morning, desires that all people be saved. Such a view seems so at odds, indeed, with that central truth that we have been coming back to again and again all summer of the gospel, that God is love unconditional for each and all. So, what shall we do at this seeming impasse? For we can't seem to believe either an easy inclusivity that says that every religion is somehow equally valid, nor can we believe that God would damn good people for eternity who happen to have the wrong beliefs. What shall we do? Well, let's try this. Consider this statement. The meaning of any answer depends entirely on the meaning of the question being asked. The meaning of any answer depends entirely on the meaning of the question being asked. When you say, for example, to someone, how are you? You are likely not asking in the chemical sense, and you would not want someone to answer you by listing their chemical components. <laughs> when someone asks you the question, how's it going? They do not mean for you to tell them in an astronomical sense, reciting the various speeds that you are moving in relation to the Earth, the Sun, and the galaxy. The reason that we seem to have ended up at an impasse here is that we too often come to this passage with the implicit question in mind, okay, God, who's in and who's out? Tell us who's in, tell us who's out. That's part of our sinful human condition. We are sometimes too quick to focus on and even sometimes obsess about drawing lines so that we can put some people on the outside and some people on the inside. But notice something. That's not the question in the scripture that Jesus is answering here. In fact, we need to return to the story itself and remind ourselves of the meaning of the question that Jesus is in fact actually answering. That question was not, Lord, who's going to be in and who's going to be out? No, it was Thomas's question from the heart. How can we know the way, Lord? That's a very different very different question. It's not a question about who's in and who's out. 
No, it's a very personal question about the meaning of my life, about how one can truly find goodness in this world, about how you can truly experience God. Do you hear the difference? To make a long story short, what Jesus says to these questions is this. You will know me not simply by having certain beliefs, but how I am at work in the lives of people to bring about goodness and hope and meaning. And so that line, no one comes to the Father except by me, it's not the description in this context of an admission requirement. No, it is the description of the fact that you and I know God through how God is at work in our lives and the lives of other people. And then Jesus says something quite extraordinary that ought to tell us for sure that he isn't trying to draw this line between the ins and the outs. He says this, believe in me, but if you do not, then believe in me because of the works themselves. Did you hear that? because of the works themselves. There's absolutely no requirement here of believing the right doctrines or saying the right words. No, seeing God's love in the lives of those whose actions express God's goodness, that's what Jesus is inviting us to do in this passage. He is saying that God is the source of good wherever it is found. And that's how we know God. I know that some of you in this room are adult converts to Christianity. And what I strongly suspect is that most of you didn't first come to the faith simply because of its beliefs, important as those are, but because of the relationships you had with people in whom you recognized a godly goodness at work, through whom you therefore learn something of what Jesus is like. We all come to our fullest knowledge of God through the way Jesus is manifested in other people and in the relationships that we have. None of us come to the Father, none of us knows God, except through the way that the life of Jesus is made evident in other people. And so because we have known God through the face and voice and hands and love of Jesus made evident in other people, we can thereby also see and we can also claim that wherever, wherever good springs out of evil, wherever hope bubbles up out of despair, wherever folks transcend selfishness and are self-sacrificing, wherever peace outwits war, wherever a good person takes a stand against hatred, wherever joy overcomes joylessness, wherever folks say no to xenophobia and fear, wherever any person speaks out for the powerless, Wherever these things happen, we thereby have seen God and we have known Jesus. We know God at work. So whether it's a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu or an atheist or whatever, wherever such fruits are found, we recognize God at work. God is at work in many ways and in many lives to overcome the despicable things that are too often done even in God's name. Quite simply, Jesus is at work wherever love is at work. And God loves and continues to love this world so much that God's own Son became one of us and in Reverend Roy Howard's beautiful words, Jesus, quote, 
is the one who heals the brokenhearted without regard to whether they are eligible for that healing or not, who opens his arms to the vulnerable and to all those on the margins. To such good news, I can only say thanks be to God. Amen.